gentlemen. Great, great. Thank you uh, for having us. Um, as Ed mentioned, my name is Andrew Kite. Uh, I spent 18 years as the director of the Family Business Center at Loyola University in Chicago and uh, have been delighted and honored to work with my friend Joe Astrakhan, who is with us. He is, we are like, we are like brothers here, so uh, you may hear us giving each other hell uh, during this presentation. That's completely normal and acceptable uh, in our relationship. So uh, um, we're, we're here, what? I said to everybody in the audience, don't be offended if you hear us. Yeah, banter. exactly. <laughs> Um, so Joe and I have worked together for many years doing research uh, on boards uh, and have published research on boards and have advised families on boards and served on boards and for the first time this year have joined a board together which we're really looking forward to. Uh, and so we're really excited to talk about this topic with you guys and uh, answer your questions. I think uh, I was actually talking to a family yesterday about I think when family business boards work well they are some of the most powerful uh, tools available. And what we often get caught up in is kind of the stereotypes of boards that we hear about public, public company boards. So we're gonna talk a lot about how family business boards are different than uh, public company boards. But to give you a little bit of a background, I'm a third generation owner in a family business uh, and have been teaching and working with families for over 25 years. And, Joe also has uh, some family business history. Uh, his family had a family business. Uh, uh, Joe, do you wanna say a few words about that before we move on? Yeah, it's the whole reason I got into family business uh, research. And uh, we had, uh, my family among, among the businesses it owned was the third largest shipping company in the world, which have I actually have islands in. Yeah, um, Sorry, if we could ask somebody to mute somebody's uh, Coming on. Yeah, I'm going through right now to make sure, but if you could make sure that you're muted, please, that'd be good, because even one person talking in the background just must this is our speakers. such an emotional story to be interrupted. I tell you, you know what? We're, we're losing it already, so. I was, in, I, was, I, was in, I was in college and the business went under, and for a whole lot of reasons, mostly because the family was fighting, and uh, decided at that point to devote myself to not letting that happen to any other family or family business. And that was uh, 1981, to give you a sense of how long I've been at this game. And uh, I'm known as the research guy in the field, although I'm retired and serve currently on eight private company boards, um, and I've served on 18 in total. Mm -hmm. So Andrew, let's, let's take it away. Great. So we're going to do a quick uh, run through of some of our uh, kind of guiding principles and thoughts about boards. Uh, and then hopefully you guys will be gathering all of your questions and engaging us. We're easy flowing, so if you have a question along the way, feel free to ask it. If you want to drop it in the chat box, we'll get to those questions as quickly as we can. So um, let me see here. If I can. So, you know, we want to start by just setting the frame for, you know, a lot of people think about boards of directors as power and control because when you think about public company boards and what we hear about public company boards is we hear about the politics and the regulations and and uh, boardroom fights of institutional investors this is really kind of turns off many people to the I, the concept of boards but at its heart uh, a board is about governance and, and uh, we all have governance methodologies it's a, a question of whether they're implicit or explicit so our governance is really a how we organize to make decisions and, and create accountability within our organizations. Um, so who has a voice in making decisions, how are decisions made, and, and how do we, who is accountable and how do we hold people accountable? Um, so some of the principles that we think are important uh, is thinking about how do we give legitimacy and voice to the stakeholders, uh, provide direction to the organization, monitor performance, create accountability and develop fairness. So if you think about these principles, these are all can be really grounding principles for a family business, uh, especially when you're going through a generational transition, uh, injecting some objectivity, some, some, some grounding in, in fairness 
and accountability with a little bit of outside uh, influence can be very helpful in stabilizing for a family going through transitions. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, one of the roles of the board is to make sure that the family, the management team, and the employees are all aligned uh, about the direction of, of the company. The family has to have an idea of what businesses do we want to be in, and, and management has to understand that. And obviously, there's overlap that we all uh, know about when family members are also on the management team. Um, so the board helps to create that alignment between the different stakeholder groups and provide accountability so that everybody can trust uh, the information in the system, the performance uh, management, uh, accountability, et cetera. Uh, as you know, there's governance across the different systems. You've got family governance, ownership governance, and business governance. And the board really uh, focuses uh, on the business governance side um, which obviously is different than, than family meetings or family councils. And some families are now moving more to ownership councils about the decisions that are specifically related to ownership. Um, but the board really uh, is focused on holding management accountable and, and representing the interests of the, the shareholders. And in most family business boards, you, you think more broadly than uh, just the shareholders, you think about all of the stakeholders, the employees, the community, customers, suppliers, in a way that often public company boards don't. Um, but the, the board of directors or board of advisors uh, really should be reviewing and approving the strategy. Ultimately, in a fiduciary board, selects the CEO and uh, you know evaluates itself and its performance. Um, but providing, making sure that, that management is providing a clear direction that's aligned with the shareholders and, and addresses the, the needs of, of the stakeholder groups. So as I said, we've all got a uh, style of governance that we exhibit. It's a question of, is it informal or, or formal? Is it uh, implicit or explicit? So, uh, you know, in a first generation business, it's usually the entrepreneur who is the governing body and making the decisions. And it's very simple uh, at that uh, range. But gradually we can move to more formal uh, styles of governance where we become more and more explicit and involve more and more voices in the conversation and uh, introduce objectivity, uh, including outsiders. So, you know, the, the spectrum may move from the entrepreneur talking to friends about uh, the challenges that they have, getting input from employees, getting uh, input from industry associates, maybe they join a peer group through one of our family business centers. Uh, but the more formal uh, parts of governance is what we're going to be talking about today, which is boards of advisors and boards of directors. So um, we think about boards from the perspective of that the role of a family business board is to provide accountability to management for articulating and achieving a vision and strategy that's consistent with the values and mission set forth by the family. Um, so again, this is not, uh, this is a, it's about creating a healthy system here uh, and making sure that uh, the management team is listening to the shareholders and the different stakeholders that they're creating a strategy that is viable. Uh, uh, and I think one of the keys that we'll talk about is that the board doesn't create the strategy, the management team creates the strategy, and the board helps to make that strategy better. Uh, you know, Herb Kohler uh, used to tell a story about how when he was a young CEO that he came to uh, the board and uh, said, I want to start a resort in Kohler, Wisconsin. And the board was like, you're crazy. Nobody wants to come to Kohler, Wisconsin. Uh, and so he went back, he worked on it, he came back, next meeting, I want to start a resort in Kohler, Wisconsin. And uh, over a period of a, a couple of years, the, the idea got better and better, and finally the board said, okay, go for it. And that is now the American Club in, in Kohler, Wisconsin, a, a very well-known resort, and, and it's a whole arm of their business, uh, uh, being uh, in resorts and, and spas and, and that type of thing. So. It's, it's not about uh, stopping you from doing things. It's about making your ideas stronger and better and making you th think through those and holding you accountable to have viable strategies. Uh, 
Uh, Joe, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, I have a I have a five year old upstairs, so I keep muting myself. Um, but Andrew, I think you're doing great. We are so completely aligned on how we view boards. If I feel I need to jump in, I will, and I'll definitely be there more for the question and answer and discussion part. That's so the go first for time it. in 25 years, Joe said you're doing great. So this is really awesome. This you're, you're seeing a, a momentous moment here. This is a once or twice in a lifetime thing, Andrew. So don't don't be <laughs> used to it. Um, so. Uh, we, we kind of referenced here in the conversation already that there's advisory boards and legal boards. And I think Joe and I are kind of a little bit agnostic about this. As long as our board uh, achieves the role of accountability and we take it seriously, you can have an advisory board that's more effective than a fiduciary board. So we're not form over function here. We want the accountability here, but the difference between an advisory board and a legal board is that an advisory board is non-binding, non uh, no fiduciary responsibility, no liability, lower costs. Um, I do know some attorneys who would argue that no fiduciary uh, responsibility uh, a little bit, but you, you can get an ar a lawyer to argue almost anything. Um, but the legal board uh, is the more formal board where you actually have a binding fiduciary obligation to the shareholders and your decisions are binding on management. Um, so as I said, many families uh, lean towards the advisory board because they tend to see things in a control uh, mindset. But even if you have a legal board, if you've got the ownership control, uh, and you've got a unified family, you can get rid of directors whenever you want to get rid of a director. And most family business directors actually uh, it would, would step down if asked. Um, so I think we overplay the power and control dynamic as an excuse to avoid the accountability uh, of a board. So uh, again, we're, we're not a form over function. We really want accountability, uh, great strategy, uh, that meets the values and vision of the, the shareholder group for uh, being in business together. So I, I've alluded to this, but uh, some of the initial research that Joe and I did was looking at uh, the, the corporate best practices that are out there on boards. And uh, the research that we did showed that most of the best practices and corporate governance codes that have been direct, you know, developed by governments or industry associations, et cetera, are really based on a public company model, which is the market uh, model, rather than a control model, which is the family business model. So uh, in the market model, you have a huge number of shareholders that are highly inactive in the company. So if you think about most of us own uh, shares in very large companies, AT&T, maybe Amazon, Apple. Uh, so the corporate governance codes were written uh, with that kind of model in mind in, for the most part, which is uh, a large group of shareholders who are highly inactive. So governance and boards in that situation really ha did orient around control and protecting those nameless, faceless shareholders across the, the, the world. Um, whereas it, that's almost the exact opposite of uh, the control model, which is where most family businesses operate, which is they have a highly active group of shareholders and it's usually extremely small, especially in relation to a, a large publicly traded company. You know, I would venture to say that, that you know, the vast majority of family businesses are under 100 shareholders uh, and often they have a highly emotional and highly active uh, view uh, of the business. Um, there are, of course, family businesses that have, have gone to the dynastic model, which is they have many shareholders at, who are also highly active and emotionally connected. So these are the kind of dynastic families that have 100 or 200 or in some of the European cases, as many as six, seven, 800 family members who are owning companies like Merck, uh, the, the, the German Merck, uh, and uh, operating uh, those businesses as, as dynastic family businesses. And then of course you've got the portfolio model which is more of the private equity model uh, 
uh, you know, few shareholders who are inactive aside from board seats, et cetera. But what we're gonna talk about is really what type of boards and governance work in that control model uh, where they're highly active family members and shareholders and relatively few of them. And again, this is where you, the, the power of a family business board, be it advisory or fiduciary, can be much more powerful than a public company board. Um, you know, so our recommendation is that when we're thinking about all of the structural questions and the, the, the concept of recruiting people to serve on the board, we want people that have the ability to hold the company accountable and the discipline not to interfere in operations, right? So we're not second guessing management's uh, decisions uh, regularly. We're, we're making sure that they have good strategy, uh, making sure monitoring performance, holding them accountable to performance. And when performance is, is waning, we might ask questions about operations, but unless the, the company is in crisis, we're, we have the discipline to stay out of company operations. So when we're talking about accountability uh, in, in, in how the board plays a role in accountability, we're talking about uh, an obligation, the, de the, the textbook definition is an obligation or willingness to accept responsibility or to account for one's action. Um, we kind of build on that a little bit uh, and it starts with making sure people do what they commit to do in a time frame to which they agreed and with the results they said they would achieve. You know, a lot of times, so uh, a friend of mine who's a therapist used to say, God is a psychologically useful concept because when you don't have a boss, you, you don't have a, a higher accountability. Um, and so uh, when we're talking about governance, uh, we're talking about in some ways, uh, having a, a group to be accountable to uh, and, uh, make sure uh, that our ideas are strong. And even just the, the process of having to explain ourselves to somebody else improves our ideas. So with the board not even having done anything, just having to explain our strategy uh, to somebody uh, makes us think about the issues differently. Um, then when people are accountable, uh, we reward when they've achieved what they said they were gonna do within the time frame, and we take corrective action when not. I think many family businesses, uh, especially when it's family members at the top, uh, can let the accountability uh, slip a little bit because we don't have to be accountable to anybody if we're the shareholders, right? Um, but it's healthy to be accountable to other people, right? We existing in a vacuum, we can uh, create our own biases in, in our own uh, universe where we believe our own press, so to speak. Having uh, a group that we are accountable to uh, should improve our performance, give us a greater sense of who we are and what we're good at, what we're not good at, um, and set boundaries uh, for the organization and for our management team. We don't want pointing fingers, which is what we end up with in family businesses many times. Uh, uh, we, we end up with whose fault is it? And when we have that accountability, we build greater trust, commitment, and momentum for our organization. Um, Joe, one of the things I learned from Joe very early on in my career, I am I'm much younger and his, his much younger and better looking brother, uh, if you guys didn't know that already. Um, but one of the things I learned from him was that when the, we want the inside of our businesses to be working so well that we can be focused on the outside. And that in order for the insides of our business to be working so well, the operations, our team, et cetera, we need to have trust, commitment, and momentum. And that is a big part of what accountability is. Uh, it generates trust, it generates commitment, and helps us build momentum for our organizations. So uh, when we're talking about communication between the family shareholders and the board, uh, the, the, the family, in order for a board to be really effective, has to be clear about its, its values, 
what our expectations are for the comp company, uh, the vision for the family's relationship with the business, why are we in business together, what are our business ownership goals. So these are a lot of conversations that many families haven't had. Uh, you know, one of the basic questions that a family can uh, make uh, is what businesses do we want to be in? You know, when you start a business, you get to choose your business partners. In a family business, you inherit your business partners. So every generation has to decide why do we want to do this? What businesses do we want to be in? What are our expectations for our return on investment? What happens if our industry is waning? How are we going to react to that? Um, so, uh, so this is speaking at a very broad level. What businesses do we want to be in? We're not dictating business strategy or business operations, but the family has to say, I have a family that says, we don't want to be in the casino business. It's not, a, it's not in our value set. Um, I have another family that I work with that has a 10 year vision, which they give to their board, which basically says we want to remain a family business. We want to make products that improve lives. Uh, we don't want to be in, uh, they've set some parameters around things about military, uh, how they engage in military uh, uh, operations because some of their products go into that space. So uh, all of that is to, to say that the family sets some broad parameters for the uh, board to uh, oversee the company and then the management team to develop strategy. So the family has to express those values. How do we want to do business? Uh, what are our expectations for the company, financial and non-financial? Uh, draw the boundaries between the family and the business. So this is where family employment policies and, and governing how, who from the family can work for the business and under what conditions. All of these are things that the family has to communicate to the board. And for a board to be effective, the board also has to be communicating with the family. You know, so they have to make sure that the family understands the basic strategic plan. If there are successes or concerns that are happening on a regular basis, uh, maybe it's great performance, maybe it's a shift, major shift in the marketplace that the family needs to understand, the board has to be making sure that the family understands those things. Uh, changes in industry and suppliers, um, status of succession planning, these are all things that the board should be communicating with the family. And many families actually will have a joint uh, board and family meeting for a period of time, at least once a year, to encourage that communication and relationship with the board. And, and sometimes it's necessary to not have the family who are in the business in the room with the outside board members to help build trust. But that mm -hmm. just depends on the family. Yeah, and I think if there's one thing that, that Joe and I uh, align on most is that a unified and cohesive family is your greatest asset as a family business. So if the decisions that you're making, whether it be board decisions or strategic decisions, uh, do not keep that in mind, it, you're, you're going to undermine the business in the long term. Um, ownership, unity, and family cohesion is the foundation of what sustains most family businesses. Yet we tend to spend most of our time talking about business structural issues because it's more comfortable, it's more tangible, uh, et cetera. So the core question is when we're talking about creating a board, does the structure of our board promote the accountability of the management team? So obviously that's a broad statement and it's got a lot of pieces to it, but whether that means do we have outsiders on the board or whether that means how many board members do we have uh, or how often do we meet when we're asking those questions, we wanna be asking those questions in the vein of does this structure promote accountability? Um, so all of that is to say that each of your families may have a different answer to these questions because accountability might look slightly different in your family and your business. So some families have, uh, you know, many uh, shareholders uh, and you might need a slightly different structure than a family that has five shareholders, right? So, uh, but always we want you to come back to this question of accountability. And when you're thinking about adding directors to the board, the most critical qualification for any director, whether they be family or non-family, is to hold the company accountable and have the discipline not to interfere in operations. 
So um, when we're thinking about which family members can serve on the board, um, we want to be thinking about that, this question is, uh, just because somebody owns shares doesn't mean that they, unless, they, unless they've got a, a majority of shares and can vote themselves onto the board, uh, you know, it's not a birthright. We want people to go into that boardroom with the mindset uh, of accountability. And again, we talked about advisory boards and boards of directors. We're, we're somewhat agnostic as long as we're filling the function of accountability. Uh, I, Joe, you can disagree with me, if, but I feel like most families that have fiduciary boards try to uh, tend to take it a little more seriously. So um, uh, my, my, might have a slight bias towards fiduciary boards, but as long as we're uh, promoting accountability, I know advisory boards that are more effective than some fiduciary boards. Definitely. All right. So if we're going to add outsiders, you know, a lot of people uh, are kind of, uh, some families are very private. Uh, so who do we share information with? Um, we want you to have a framework to think about. If we're going to add outsiders, what should they look like? So we don't want somebody who's got a, a relationship with the company already, you know, uh, somebody who a key employee may not be willing to uh, tell the truth to. So if I've got my country club friends on the board or my attorney or my uh, accountant, um, you know, they don't have fully objective viewpoints because they have vested interest either in our friendship, our business relationship, etc. So if we're going to add outsiders, we want people who can think critically, who have experience with, with boards and experience going where we uh, need to go as a company. So we might want somebody who's been through the, the, the growth cycle that we're going to be go th going through as a family or dealt with some of the uh, strategic problems or issues that we've been dealing with a, as a company. Uh, so uh, uh, people from a company that looks like what you want yours to look like in three to five years. Um, let, let me interrupt now because I want to answer a question that was typed in, which is what's the ballpark uh, bell curve for directors and family businesses and private companies? And it's, it's all over the place. It's largely dependent on the size of the business. So you'd have to do a bell curve for each different size category. But in general, there's a simple rubric or heuristic that we use that seems to flow really well with when consultants come in and do um, salary surveys for board members or board pay surveys. And that is you take the CEO's fully loaded pay and preferably what you would like the CEO's fully loaded pay to be in about five years. You divide that by 250, which is the number of working days in a year, and that's your daily rate for board members. And you figure that each day of board meeting uh, requires a full day of preparation. So each meeting is two days of the CEO's pay, or what you would like it to be in three to five years. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important thing here is that that pay shows that you're taking this seriously, right? That you think that the board is just as important as that CEO um, and you're recognizing that uh, financially. You know, the, the great directors that are out there on family business boards aren't doing it for the money. You know, they just wanna know you're taking it seriously and they wanna make a difference. And what the directors that I've talked to who love serving on family business boards, it's because they don't have all of the um, bureaucracy of a public company board and they can really be dealing with the strategic challenges that the family business is facing and not politics of activist investors and those type of things. They can really be having an impact to grow and improve the business. So we want directors, uh, uh, to be people, not, not the people you can buy advice from unless it's cheaper to have them on your board than to buy their advice. Um, and people who are willing to give you their opinion that, and, and open dissent. And you know, one of the, the keys to that is can they deliver that dissent in a way that people can hear it? You know, 
um, because there are pe plenty of people who can speak their mind, but they do it in a way that alienates other people. And uh, I had that on a, a family business board that I uh, was working with. One of the directors uh, would, would confront management in a way that was really destructive to the relationship between the board and management uh, and uh, resulted in her not really being heard uh, as a director. So ended up needing to, to move on from, from that director. Um, but for non-family directors, some of the challenges that they face is understanding the importance of family unity. Um, we're actually doing some training with, with independent directors on the, these exact things that they have to understand that the family unity is a key asset to the family business. If you don't invest in the family and the family relationships, the family is going to be a liability on the balance sheet rather than an asset. We want to be making the investments that put the family uh, uh, as an asset on the balance sheet rather than a liability. Uh, the non-family directors have to realize that they have to communicate with the family and, and that often these aren't just business issues, that there are family implications to many of the standard business issues. And you can't just say, we just need to treat this like a business issue. You know, there's a whole uh, school within the family business world that, that talks about, are you a business first family or a family first business? And I think that oversimplifies uh, and tries to create a dichotomy where there's not a dichotomy. Um, it's really uh, the, how do you create a sense of family unity that we can be in uh, business or businesses together and uh, not an either or. Uh, a far, family business is much more complex than that. And again, productively challenging. So let's talk a little about things. So the research that Joe and I did uh, kind of looking at what the most effective family business boards do, this is, we were trying to move beyond those corporate governance codes that were based on uh, public companies. And so what we found when we, when we talked about this in the context of accountability is, is that boards uh, should meet somewhere between four and six times a year. If you're meeting more than six times a year, it's most likely you're getting into operational issues and, and unless you're in a crisis, uh, you should not be meeting more frequently. So, uh, oh, by the way, we've had a crisis the last four or five months. So many boards have been meeting more than, than six times uh, because of that and that's okay. But in general, what we're talking about from a, an accountability standpoint is meeting four to six times a year gives you enough uh, opportunity to get the information you need, see the trends, have the conversations to hold the management team accountable. If you're meeting less than four times a year, you're probably not getting enough information, uh, having enough exposure to the management team uh, to effectively uh, hold management accountable. Our research shows that uh, having a separate CEO and chairman can increase performance. Um, again, if you think about it from an accountability standpoint, if the chairman and the CEO are the same person, will the chairman put together an agenda that really uh, holds the management team accountable? Will they open up uh, the kimono, so to speak, in a way that uh, invites uh, accountability? Um, having a separate CEO and chairman uh, can increase that sense of accountability. Joe, this is from research that you looked at. Why don't you take this next bullet point? Well, this is from public company research because there has yet to be any um, research on private companies. And what they looked at was the ratio of family members and insiders to out outsiders. Uh, and look at performance, which they measured as a return measure. And they found the magic number was two outsiders to each family member on the board was the optimal uh, ratio for performance, for corporate mm -hmm. performance. Nothing about what it does to the family, just, to the, just for the business. Right. And so that, that's another key uh, thing to note in that research is that a lot of the, the when you're looking at performance and research on public companies, they're only using the financial measures of performance and not looking at the values and cultural uh, performance pieces that are often very, very important to families. 
Um, board diversity reduces the likelihood of strategic change. Um, again, I think this is another one of yours, Joe. It's, uh, there, there have been a number of studies on, on board diversity and change. And while there's a lot of evidence that board diversity can lead to greater decision making, um, one of the things that happens when you have a greater variety of opinions, at least this is what the study said, is that people find it harder to come to a decision and find it harder to make big change. So you have to balance the level of diversity with the need for change. And if you need a lot of change, at the very least, find people, even if it's a diverse board, who are change-minded and see need for change early and quickly. That's what that research would suggest. Hey, Joe, it's Ed, real fast. Can you define diversity? Are you talking more about like legal, CFO? No, it was all kinds of diversity. It was gender diversity, it was racial diversity, it was everything, they looked at everything. Excellent, thanks for clarifying. No worries. And I, I just like Joe was saying, the, the research on diversity has been somewhat mixed uh, in terms of some, some pieces supporting performance and some saying that it's more difficult to get the board on the same page on issues. All right, so, you know, just putting together a board and having the right skill sets uh, in directors, et cetera, doesn't mean your board's gonna be able to create accountability. You have to think through this in terms of how do we create an effective board meeting, right? So the chairman needs to engage effectively with the management team and board members to be clear about what are the important issues that we need to be discussing at the board, le uh, board level. You know, the, the time that you spend with your board is, uh, very important and so we want to use that time effectively we don't want to just have our board meeting become a series of reports which is a common mistake when families create a board is that they think that all the work goes is just in putting the board together um, but it really continues on to orienting the new board members to get them ready to uh, be able to give you input and feedback and then creating an agenda for uh, an effective board meeting so you uh, the chairman has to understand that the key issues uh, from the management team and the board members and have an effective agenda. Um, you know, there are both procedural agenda items and strategic agenda items. We want to be spending most of our time on the strategic and agenda items. Ideally, we want our board to be talking about uh, the future and how, where we're going than spending 90% of our time looking backwards unless there's a crisis um, that we're trying to figure out what's going wrong. Uh, we prefer to be talking about uh, moving forward and, and, and monitoring what happened in the past, but not uh, obsessing about what happened in the past. And then the next piece is we have to be able to put together a board packet of information ahead of time so that directors can prepare and be ready to discuss the issues uh, coming uh, out. Uh, and one of the common mistakes that happens here is we get a data dump from uh, management. So one of the families that I worked with when I started working with their board, their board pre-read was 400 pages uh, for a meeting. And that shows that management has put very, very little thought into what is strategically important information that the board needs to understand in order to have a discussion about a business issue. So they've gotten that down to 100 pages, which is quite an improvement, but probably, uh, probably more to go in terms of thinking about what's the information that the board needs to have. And that doesn't mean the board can't dig deeper if they have questions, but um, in terms of getting them the strategic information that they need to have the discussions that we need to have at the, the board level. And many families create an annual board calendar that says, okay, we're always gonna look at the budget uh, in the fourth quarter, uh, we're always going to look at our previous year's financial results in the first quarter. We're always going to talk about strategy in the second quarter. You create a, a regular pattern to make sure that we cover all the important issues uh, on a regular basis throughout the year. And obviously this year that pattern has been thrown completely out of whack. So yeah, sometimes that happens. <laughs> Yeah, well, and, and like family businesses, boards need to be agile and deal with the reality uh, of where we are. 
And then also you want to be able to track important things through your minutes, not overly, your board minutes should not be a verbatim uh, transcript of everything that was discussed. Um, your board minutes should be really monitoring what are the key issues that we're looking at and holding, making sure that we're, we have a track record on some of those things that we're monitoring these things and any important actions that were taken because of it. Not, not you know, detailed descriptions of the discussions. So the chairman's responsibility is to put that all together, to facilitate board meetings, uh, to build the board into a cohesive and effective team. So if, if our board's gonna be effective, we've gotta have people that work well together. So they're gonna to have to build relationships with each other and with the management team. Uh, having goals and objectives for the board is, is important and effective. And we wanna make sure that all of our board members are involved in discussions. So one of the roles of the chairman is if somebody's not speaking up, to find ways to draw them out, uh, to give them feedback asking, to for them to be more active um, and not to just let them passively sit by. You can do that with facilitation uh, methods of uh, going around the room. You can uh, you know, call on people. There are a lot of different tools you can use from a facilitation standpoint, but you wanna make sure that everybody speaks up. And you want independent advice to the CEO. Uh, assure that directors have the information to make the informed decisions and uh, that management's accountable to the board. So, so these, this references kind of some of the facilitation methods uh, that can be uh, employed by the chairman. So people talking under, under uninterrupted and not for too long, that they don't go off topic unless we agree, that that can be uh, a big time suck on your family board meetings is if somebody opines on something that's really not an agenda item. Decisions we're, that we pre-agree how we're gonna make decisions, is it a majority, is it super majority? And uh, uh, that we uh, vote where necessary. Um, but the chair shouldn't be dominating, right? And the chair needs to be aware that when they speak first, it sets the stage and can often ground a discussion in their opinion. So if we're truly gonna get the most out of our board, uh, we want to think about the fact that, uh, that if the chair is the one driving all the discussions, we're probably limiting the voice uh, and input of the outside directors. And I'm going to add something here, which is I've mentored a number of chairs. And one of the things I like to tell them up front is your, your job is not to give your opinion. Your job is to know all the opinions of your board members in advance. And if you want to manage the discussion and manage it in a particular direction, one of the ways that you can do this is by calling on the people who reflect the opinion you want at the given time that you need it. Or alternatively, when you know somebody has an opinion which is not the same, let them get it out of the way early and let them talk themselves out so that you're not arguing back and forth and you're limiting the amount of arguing that's going on in the board meeting. Mm -hmm. And when, when you get people who are being entrenched in an argument, um, encouraging examples can often be a, an effective way to kind of back them off of, 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 this is my opinion, this is your opinion, opinion. let's talk examples, let's play out these scenarios uh, with uh, real examples uh, to understand those differences. Everybody needs a chance to talk. Uh, understand the difference between family and business issues. So if there's an issue that's really not in the board's purview and is really a family issue, recognize it and make sure that the family deals with it, not the board. Uh, sometimes families make, you know, a family that's not communicating well can often make the board the venue to have those dysfunctional conversations. Again, that uh, will kill your board quickly. Um, so if you've got family issues, deal, that, deal with them in the family venue. Uh, and you can ask for input from your board on certain issues uh, from, as a, from a family perspective, but don't put them in the middle. And then the board should evaluate itself, evaluate its own communication in between directors, uh, committees, strategy, uh, how are we doing on financials, and, and are we addressing the important legal issues? 
are we achieving our financial goals and are we, are we thinking about succession? You know, uh, I, I had a family business owner, third to fourth generation transition and uh, the fourth generation CEO uh, said to me, the biggest value our board ever uh, offered to our family was that every quarter they would come in and ask my dad what his succession plan was. And after about three or four years, my dad got tired of not having an answer. So he finally motivated to start thinking about a transition plan uh, and holding, holding dad's feet to the fire. Um, so uh, board evaluation uh, is, is a critical point. You know, a board just like the management team should be saying, are we doing a good job? What can we do better? What do we wanna do differently in the year ahead? And having an evaluation process that, that pushes that uh, forward is important. So um, would love to engage in a conversation with all of you at this point. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing so that uh, we can see people's faces as they ask questions. Um, but we'd really love to uh, dialogue with you uh, about everything uh, that you've been asking. So we have some things in the chat box, but I would also welcome anybody to uh, unmute themselves and, and ask a question themselves. If anybody that put anything in the chat wants to ask themselves, they can. If not, I'll be happy to read it. So I'll give you a, a couple seconds to, to chime in if you'd like. Mm -hmm. So I'll, ask, I'll start with the bottom there, Andrew, the last question that came up, and I've got a follow-up question to that as well. Isabel asks, what is the average tenure of a chairman? And I'm gonna ask the part two of that question and an average tenure of a board member. I know some of us have board members that are on for a year, two years, five years. Is there a, an average or a preferred time for a chairman and for a board member? Jay, you want to? Yeah, no, I, I, would, I would rephrase it a little bit and say what the most important thing is, is that you always have a bench that's available to you and that you make a transition in a time frame that allows the bench to grow into their role. And that's true for a succession to a CEO as well as succession inside the board. So you want to keep people around one, as long as they're really adding value and two, as long as they don't need to make way for somebody who needs to learn the role before it becomes dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a, that's an art form. That's not a, a definite scientific method. Yeah. Gary Ridge, who's the CEO of WD 40, who we've had on these workshops before has said that too with succession planning. He, he doesn't use the term succession planning. He uses build your bench. Same, same concept. Yeah. yeah. And, and one of the things that, that Joe has said for many years, which is you want an organization that's strong enough to survive three bad CEOs hmm. uh, because you're not going to be guaranteed you're going to make the right CEO call first, first time uh, off the bat. Um, so if we can survive multiple bad transitions and hopefully we, we learn faster than going through three bad CEOs. Um, sure. But we want our organization to be strong enough to, so that one singular decision doesn't sink the ship. Excellent. My colleague Sean up in uh, Canada at University of Alberta is asking about where does a family look to go outside to get board members? How do you direct your families in finding these individuals? There are a variety of different ways you can do this. Um, there's the formal search mode. Um, and there are different levels of search. Uh, you know, there's the, the fully tripped out uh, boutique corn fairy hydric and struggles search firm where they uh, go out and you spend a lot of money and they find people for you. I've had a lot of success with uh, mid sized family businesses and smaller family businesses uh, with having a, a job description for what we're looking for in a director and sending it out through different circles. So our family business center at Loyola does this regularly for members. Um, there's, uh, there are organizations that serve directors that you can get to post those uh, announcements. Uh, to give you an example, I have a family that's in the middle of a board search right now. Um, and we've gotten 122 resumes from just, just distributing that announcement through these different directors associations and through our personal networks. And now we're gonna sift through that. Um, if you're using the, the full search firm, uh, which can 
you know, cost 125, 150,000 per director, uh, you know, you, they will sift through all that for you. Um, but uh, many families ha are, are very effective by just uh, developing a pool of candidates through their networks. But again, you wanna be thinking about objectivity and the ability to provide accountability. Uh, I think Sally had her hand up. Yeah. Sally's from Watt Companies out here in Southern California, Sally? Uh, yes, uh, Joe was talking about how devastated he was when he was, I think, a junior in college and suddenly finding out that uh, his family company was no longer. Uh, Joe, did you uh, get any kind of uh, hints uh, or, or the family, was it dysfunctional and you could tell? Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. It was a, it was a classically dysfunctional family, um, especially at the broader level, not my own little family. Um, my father largely <laughs> escaped a lot of that stuff because when he was, this is tragic too, when he was 16, his father died, and when he was 18, his mother died. So he kind of extricated himself from the larger family. But the, um, the great uncle who built the business had no kids. He, we had family members who were required to marry the bookkeeper. Does anybody know why you would be required to marry the bookkeeper? No, because according to law, if you're not you're 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 not allowed to testify, or you are able to escape testifying against somebody if you're married to them. Oh. So, so we had that kind of situation going on. Um, we had lots of family dysfunction. Now everybody gathered, but you could tell that it was not a family that was open and honest with one another, uh, which are which are hallmarks of any strong family, the ability to be open and honest and still maintain loving relationships without having any sense of coercion or emotional manipulation going on, you know, no guilt tripping and stuff like that. So I, I, we knew how bad it was. And in this particular case, what had happened was when great uncle Joe, who was the one who built the company, it was called C-Train Lines for the few of you on the call who are old enough to remember um, companies like that. In fact, it, if anybody likes old television shows, Hawaii Five O used to have C train lines on it all the time. Um, and uh, uh, when he passed away, the family couldn't decide who his successor was. And Chase Bank, which was the holder of about 300 million of debt, even though the company was worth over a billion dollars before it went bankrupt, decided after about six months that this was to be no longer. And by the way, the board was ineffective. It was a very puppet board. So when he died, the board just fell apart. Um, and the Chase Bank said no more. And the company went away. It went from $35 a share to uh, 19 cents a share um, in one day. So don't let anybody tell you that business valuation is solid, rock solid. And I was the stupid one who bought a lot of shares at 19 cents. Only <laughs> a little bit all six months later. So. Thank you. Buy low and sell lower, huh, Joe? Yeah, exactly. Buy, buy low <laughs> and lose you, you were young enough to take that risk then. There you yeah, go. So it wasn't a lot of money that I had. It was my life savings, but it wasn't a lot. <laughs> we had a question that came in earlier from uh, Isabella. How should the board communicate with the owners, especially if the owners have their own government's bo governance body? And what are the lines of, of accountability there? Sure. Um, so I think it, regular communication is important. Having defined channels and, and structure around that can help uh, to create consistency. And uh, oftentimes uh, you need to educate both the family and the board members about what is that boundary. Uh, most, most often the board members are pretty clear when it becomes a family issue, um, but family members aren't always clear uh, about the boundary between the family and, and the board. And they think that because I'm a shareholder, I should be able to hold uh, court at a board meeting and have them listen to me. Uh, you know, unless you're the controlling shareholder, you, you don't really have that, that right to, to sit in the, in the board meetings for those things. But they do that through uh, educating uh, family members through board observer programs where they get to observe and understand uh, what does it mean? Uh, what does the board really do? What kind of their discuss? What are their real discussions that they have? Um, get the 
family feedback about uh, those roles. Um, but being in active communication is often the best practice because then you may stumble and you can say, okay, well, that's really a board issue and that's not a family issue. If we're not in a regular pattern of discussion, uh, we're not going to find those boundaries. We're not going to be able to have that conversation. Anything you'd add to that, Joe? Just that, you know, that, that, uh, that if you have a governance group in, in, involved already, it's really helpful if somebody from that governance group acts as a liaison between the two and sits in on the board meetings and can be available during the board meetings for advice on what the family's thinking at any given time without having to go through a long and drawn out process of getting to the family to uh, canvas their opinions. Mm -hmm. John Summerfield, I saw your picture come up. Are you chiming up because you want to ask a question or? Whoops, you're on mute, John. It wouldn't be a Zoom call if we didn't hear that. Exactly. That's, I've heard that's the number one phrase that we say this year is you're I, on. I had to reboot my computer. No problem. It, everything froze up. So uh, when it came back up, I came up. So. Okay. No question. That's it. Okay. Thank you, John. But I, you know, while I'm on here, um, I think this is really great. It's uh, you know good information. So, thank you. Thank, thank you, John. John and his twin brother and their boys run a, a large uh, pump company out here in Southern California. Been active members of our center since the very beginning in 1995. I have a question for you, uh, gentlemen. I, I know companies have their own mission statements and value statements and vision statements and so forth. And I've sat in on and been on boards that have their own as well. What advice do you have when it comes to a board creating its own board specific mission or vision or values and how it aligns with the company? Any, any input or thoughts or examples on that? I, I don't know. I've, like I said, I've been on 18. I've never experienced that. Okay. No. I, I've experienced boards talking about their, what their goals and objectives as a board are for the year. Not, sure. not as much about, mission having a separate mission or vision um but i've heard them talk about you know how can we be more effective as a board uh do we have any goals or objectives about improving our board participation or board engagement in some way maybe that's creating uh, a different committee structure or uh re-engaging differently with the management team but they have active conversations about how they can become better as a board Thank you. And then I'll jump in with another follow-up question until somebody else might want to jump in as well. Um, what do you say to that company? And I know there's a lot on here and also a lot that couldn't be here with us today who, who are eager to get this recording. A first step. I know I work with a lot of family businesses here in Southern California that don't have a board, but it's been on their mind for a long time. What would you suggest as a first step that they take just to start inching that direction? The first thing you need to do is uh, Enroll in Andrew's uh, mm -hmm. uh, governance institute. I can set that up for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. No, we created a program at Loyola really to teach family members how to you know, become the best director that they could be in their own family business board. Understand the the board uh, universe. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it, it really is around making sure that the family is fully supportive and educated about what a board is, what it does. Um, because if we're not unified uh, about uh, engaging in a board, uh, the family will find passive ways to uh, circumvent the board or, or uh, undercut the board. Um, but first steps start with kind of what, where, what's the current status of our uh, accountability? Uh, and how might a board help us uh, increase accountability within our, our system? And if we have a culture that's heavily uh, leaning on blame and shame, that's probably gonna be a pretty toxic culture uh, for a board to uh, start engaging. But if we have a healthier culture, you know, it may be easier to get started on, on a board process. Um, there are boards that have um, helped change those cultures too. Sure. And then, and then a second step um, or a third step should be creating a dossier on all the important information regarding the company mm -hmm. from uh, 
uh, you know, all the foundational documents to board minutes, if there are any, to who the top customers are, who the top suppliers are, et cetera. So that when you do get to the point where you want to start recruiting board members, all of that's available. For you. And, and that can even, you know, this, it's not uncommon for us to, to find a family who actually is not clear about their strategy. And uh, if, can we explain our strategy to somebody, you know, that can be a, a, a stepping point to creating that, that board book. Can we explain our strategy and what we're trying to accomplish? Can we explain our positioning in the marketplace? Can we explain, explain our growth plans? Um, and those are all things that you should be able to do when you're creating a board. A couple of questions have popped up. Thank you so far, by the way. Marla has asked, I have clients who I, I've encouraged they use an advisory board, however, they resist. Do you have a way to convince the client of the benefits? This is uh, legal uh, or illegal method. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's start with legal. Um, yeah. There was, and this is one of the reasons why I have a slight bias towards a fiduciary board because of the power to select the CEO. But I was sitting with a, a, a guy once and he was saying, you keep saying, put a board together, put a board together, I'm just not convinced. I'm just not convinced. And I said, listen, someday your eight-year-old son may be in line to take over and he may not be up to it. Are you the one who's going to want to tell your wife that? Hmm. And he said, I'm putting a board in place. <laughs> there you go. I have another kind of funny story along that wet lines. Uh, I had a client who I had been trying to put to get, get to put together a board and we got to the point where we were about to hire the outside directors. We had been through the interview process. He shuts it down, puts the company for sale, uh, and you know goes through the sale process, realizes that the offers that he's getting are not what he thought the value of the company was, comes back, uh, says, okay, we're not selling, and then kind of reinvigorates this uh, uh, board search. Uh, we put the board together about three years after we put the board together, this was last year, he was on that Norwegian cruise line that got uh, stalled in the North Sea and he gets airlifted off the uh, uh, boat in the middle of a storm. Uh, and he said to me, as I'm being hauled off the deck of this ship in this storm, not sure whether I'm gonna live or not, not sure where my wife is. My only thought was, thank God I have a board the business is going to be okay. Yeah, absolutely. So Isabel says you talked a lot about the role and uh, description of the board chair. What about the role of the CEO in relation to the board? I know it probably is. It depends. It might be your answer, but how would you describe the role of the CEO to the board? And the CEO is beholden to the board. So the CEO has to work through and with the chairman to make the board function well. And that includes getting out information, responding to requests, opening up the lines of uh, communication for board members. Boards tend to work a lot better when they have open communication all the way throughout the company to gather their own information. So things, things of that order are, are what the CEO's responsibilities to the board are. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you're, if your CEO is insecure and cannot take feedback or cannot engage in conversations in a way that uh, uh, feedback comes out uh, effectively, you know, you've, you've got a real issue there. Um, you know, any good CEO should be willing to uh, get, take feedback from the board, respect the uh, advice that they're getting and say, uh, it doesn't mean they have to agree with it, right? So Herb Kohler didn't just say, okay, my board said I can't do this, so I'm not gonna do this he went back and he made his idea stronger and came back. And after years of persistence, uh, you know, the board said, all right, it's a better idea. Now he cares about it enough that he's going to make it a success. We're going to let him do it. You touched on this in your presentation a little bit earlier, uh, Andrew, but ultimately all of us have members of our boards and the companies that I've talked to where maybe there's an individual or two on the board that either, for whatever reason, isn't measuring up. They aren't contributing, they aren't attending, what have you. I'm guessing the, the answer to this question is the chairman of the board should have that empowerment to, to make those decisions. But 
is a lot of boards, the CEO appoints the board members and then the chairman is appointed by the CEO and so forth. Can you talk a little bit about a scenario where if someone's not measuring up what the process could be? Well, so if, you, if, if we're talking about a, a fiduciary board, it's going to be different than an advisory board. The right. advisory board, uh, you're going to have, you're going to need to create clarity about how our directors selected and who has a voice in the process, et cetera. If you're talking about a fiduciary board, you're bound by legal uh, voting uh, mechanisms. So, um, you know, the shareholders vote. Uh, the slate of directors. So typically you'll have a nomination and governance committee that will be uh, doing the board evaluation. And if you have a director who's not performing, the first step is uh, to, you know, hopefully that comes out in the board evaluation process. The chairman can have an individual conversation with that director to say, this is feedback for you. And, and uh, you know, this happened with a family that I helped put together a board a couple of years ago that one of the new directors, literally the first two or three meetings said maybe four words. And uh, after the third meeting, we said, listen, we really need to know what you're thinking here. And uh, if, if this doesn't improve, we can't really. Uh, so we, we, you know, just like, an employee, we, we had a conversation with them about, about, you know, that performance and uh, ultimately it didn't improve. So we had to, to, to move on. So there's the regular election cycle. So what are the terms of directors? And so you can let somebody go at the end of their term, or you, I, I think, uh, I think Joe and I both feel this way is that if a family feels like a director's not pulling their weight, not doing their job, not adding value that we should feel, uh, empowered to have that conversation with them at any time. Uh, and uh, well, you have to understand what your bylaws say about how does that process work and, and, and the voting and everything. Um, but you should be empowered to, to make a move whenever a director's not adding value. And especially in generational transitions, oftentimes the directors that serve the parents well aren't necessarily the directors that are going to help the next generation move forward. I just went through this over the last four years with a client who third generation came in as chair and, and had to really revamp the board to fit the challenges uh, of the next five years and not serve the, the generation that went before. Great, great suggestion. Thanks, both of you. Uh, we have a few more minutes. I know a few more people have popped up on the screen. Uh, this is your time if you have any questions. Great opportunity to ask Joe or Andrew any questions or any comments that you might have. So Joe, Issa Botero uh, has a question about the role of the chairman and how is that the, not related to the responsibilities of the CEO? So that's what we just answered. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I'm, I'm the chairman and you're the CEO, so I'm telling you. <laughs> there you go. I, I really got to up my game as CEO then. Yeah, no, I, yeah. Yeah, we've, we're, we've been talking about that in the family, Andrew. I'm glad. Well, mom loved me more than she loved you, so. There you go. Okay, now we're watching a family dispute, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Not that we've ever seen any of these, right? Oh, no, you've never seen that one before. Uh, under what circumstances do you recommend no family on the board and if that is the case, what method do you rec recommend for the family to use to direct the board? I don't know that I've ever had a situation where I would say there should be no family member on the board. You'd have to have gross incompetence to have no family member on the board. Mm -hmm. uh, even in the case of severe family conflict, I would still have family on the board for the, for the benefit of the family. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would be working a process to try and bring the family back to harmony or create harmony in the family for the first time, as many conflicted families have never been in harmony and don't know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen that play out once, and what happened, what the family did was, the family was able to agree on two trusted advisors uh, that the feuding family uh, all trusted, and they kind of installed them on the board as the the, eyes and ears of the family because both of those directors were, or both of those advisors, uh, you know, had the trust of the family. And I think, you know, traditionally, you know, the, under the normal circumstances, those individuals wouldn't have fit the criteria of an independent board member, quote unquote, but because they held the trust of the family, 
um, they were able to serve in that capacity. And uh, yeah, Ken, please. In our, our years of having a board, we had you know five family members and five board members. We always hired an outside consultant to be the facilitator of the meetings. Is is that a common uh, thing? We we just felt that that would really help us, uh, uh, and um, in that so, and I think it did. On the boards that I'm on, usually um, that's one of the reasons I'm on some of those boards to be that facilitator. Mm -hmm. But that's more of a permanent lead director position. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's especially important uh, if uh, there's a chairman who maybe that's just not in their skill set, right? Facilitation's not uh, one of their core competencies. And so I've, I've seen more commonly the naming of a lead director. So uh, a, one of the directors that has uh, those skill sets taking on that facilitation role. Uh, I've only I've, I've only seen the kind of outside facilitator once or twice. Yeah, I have no, nothing against it. I think it could be very functional. Yeah, sure. yeah it's, I, it's again. Harder, it's harder to find a facilitator who can also make a good board member in the other ways they need to be a good board member. Right, it's right. And, and I think if there's one message that that we want to kind of portray here is is it's, this isn't about form over function. This is uh, about what will work best for us, our board to operate uh, most effectively. And that can be in a really powerful thing if if we have an outside facilitator managing that. Uh, I do think that the leadership of the board needs to take responsibility over agenda items and uh, you know what should be on the agenda. Um, in a meaningful way. A question came up on chat and then Kip, I'll go to you next because I know that you popped up. Uh, the question was part two, part one is have you ever experienced a board, and I think I know where you're going with this because I know what I would say, where there's been conflict between the board and family members. <laughs> That's kind of, I think, a given. Part two is steps or advice on how to handle that conflict. Um, I've resigned. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, that's uh, that's a good answer, I think. Yeah, and, and that, that was in situations where even using all of my skills couldn't bring the family back to the kind of harmony that it needed for the board to be effective, and the board was just ineffective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and any, uh, you, you want your directors to feel the, the uh, confidence that if there is an irreconcilable difference that they're, they're willing to say, you know, this isn't my company, so... I'll resign and, uh, uh, you know, where you get into real trouble is where you've got an independent director who needs the paycheck or needs the, uh, for ego, the title of being a director on this board. And so they dig in their heels and they try to prove they're right. And, uh, you know, uh, we serve at the, the pleasure of the family as a family director, and we should be willing to speak our mind. And if our, if, if our comments and our insights aren't uh, valued, then we should be willing to move on. And we, should, we shouldn't stick around just because uh, we need the paycheck or we want the, the title. Kip, if you don't mind, I'm gonna jump in with Shauna's question because it can sure. sort of touch on this topic and then I'll go to you if you don't mind. Okay. Shauna, again, up in Canada, just says, how do you manage when the advisory board has a bias toward one family member, good or bad, and are not being fully objective in their decision-making and recommendations? Biases are obviously human nature. So how do you address that? I think that largely depends on where you sit in the configuration. Are you a manager? Are you a family member? Are you one of the other board members? So I, I think the advice would be different based on, on where you sit. If you're one of the other board members and you're watching it happen, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would try and have a lot of offline discussions with the other board members to talk about how this was creating a rift in the family, how this was not good for the family in the long run, and how at the very least we needed to be respectful of the family members that were in the minority and help them be heard and have voice, at least enough so that they're comfortable with whatever decisions are happening. And so that they didn't feel like they were being steamrolled in any way by the, uh, the board process as it is uh, unfolding. Excellent. Thank you, Joe. Kip and his son, Kevin Colson, run Family Wealth Leadership here in Orange County, California. Kip, your question yes. or comment? Thank you. 
uh, yeah, what is your experience as far as uh, ownership as it moves from generation to generation? So for example, if you have four children, assuming each would get 25%, and then as those, the lineage in each of those uh, families starts to grow, does the ownership remain at 25% for that lineage, or do they start bringing more of the children or you know, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, so forth, and start to split that on a more individual basis? So everybody starts owning smaller percentages. Does that make sense, to the question? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, and it's something that every family is going to face in some way, shape, or form over time. And the question comes, and I remember working with some very notable families around this, and when you pose the question to the family, and usually it has to happen in the third generation, are you one family or are you four families? Hmm. And if in some way uh, the, the idea of recognizing branches and establishing branches and structuring them in is going to structure in a long-term conflict, then that isn't necessarily a good thing. And if you can figure out a better way or a different way of doing it where the ownership as it is being passed or being purchased um, after each generation has a way of reinforcing the oneness of the family, then that's really the way you want to go. Mm -hmm. um, over time, families can't provide, the business can't provide for families. We've done a lot of different modeling to really show that if you wanted, you know, say in the first generation, it's giving the owners a certain level of, of pay each year. And if you wanted that to continue and you had say three family members per family member per generation, the profits of the company would have to grow at over 7% before inflation. And to sustain that over a 40 year stretch until the next generation is coming on board, it's, it's next to impossible to do that. Which is where the, the fabric of family relationships comes in as a key variable here is that when we've got trust and cohesion in the family, we can have some of these conversations about uh, our commitment to each other, our commitment to the legacy, our commitment to something greater than just ourselves. And you know, there are certainly structural ways you can do that, but that doesn't guarantee the family harmony. So there are families that put together voting trusts that uh, equalize everybody as beneficiaries and then has a separate governance model for decision-making um, but that doesn't guarantee uh, that the family is going to get along. And so the family has to continually invest in their relationships to make sure that the family is an asset, not a liability on the balance sheet. You know, it's, it's, you know, there's a whole uh, generation of family business consultants that kind of saw the family as uh, the enemy of the business. And you just got to keep the family away from the business to keep the business successful because the family is going to, ruin the business. And I always say, well, why don't you create the family that's not going to, you don't have to worry about protecting the business from, right? <laughs> and that's going to be a much more fulfilling situation if we've got uh, family members who love and care for each other and are thinking not just about their own self-interest, but the best interests of everybody. You know, so I'll give you a quick uh, real life example of a, a family that was in one of my classes. Um, the parents, uh, there was two sons in the business and a daughter uh, not in the business, uh, who was a musician and uh, uh, lived in New York City. And she asked her parents if they could help with a down payment for a condo, which was about $50,000 or something like that. And the brothers freaked out. Like, how are you going to give her $50,000 and not give us $50,000? And uh, the sister said to the parents, if this is going to create a rift in the family, I don't want to do it, right? Our relationships are more important to me than $50,000. And the, the, what actually came out over after she said that was the parents did some analysis, looked at what the boys were being com compensated for in the business, found that they were probably being overcompensated a little bit and uh, showed them the reality of that they were getting some benefits that she wasn't getting. And, uh, ended up with a really rich family conversation and the family being a lot more connected than, uh, than you know, the I want this for me uh, conversation. And the end result was probably the brothers approved that yep. amount. The, 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 the end result was, the, the end result was the brother's pay got uh, 
benchmarked and uh, they got a little bit of a reduction in pay. Uh, and then the parents gave $50,000 to all three kids. And everybody's happy. That's wonderful. Love success stories like that. Last couple of moments before we ask any more questions. Um, I will ask at the end of this, but I'm going to turn it back for questions. If Joe and Andrew, if each of you could do two things before we wrap in a moment or two. <clears throat> Number one, best way to reach you, and then any final comments before we go there. Last call for questions if anyone has any. Okay, I waited the obligatory seven seconds. So, uh, Joe, why don't we start with you? Um, any, uh, well, first of all, how do people reach you? The, the content today has been tremendous. We've been getting comments. I've been getting text messages and emails from people as well, just full of gratitude for the two of you joining us today and, and sharing your, your wisdom with us. Um, the impact of this presentation will live long after this presentation today with copies of it and so forth. So thank you from the bottom of my heart and our hearts mm -hmm. for, you. for you sharing with us today. I know uh, it's been just uh, a sacrifice for you on your time and not only preparation, but also the time today to be with us. And thank you to all of you who attended today and those that are listening after today as well. So Joe, um, final last words of wisdom, how people can reach you. And then Andrew, I'll give you the final word. Not so sure what I have to say is wisdom, and I'm really appreciate the opportunity to be here and and you know help uh, actualize my life mission, in helping family businesses globally. I think that if you are a constant lifelong learner and you have that orientation and you have a self improvement orientation, and you're willing to reach out and admit what you don't know, there are so many people who are willing to give advice and provide opinions and provide help. Uh, and in reinvigorating your board or even in starting a board, that's something you can do. Just reach out and find those people who are willing to help you and give you advice. And like so many things in life, if you don't like what you're hearing and it, it doesn't feel right, either do more investigating to understand why or go find some other uh, opinions that, that fit more with who you are and what you need. Um, the best way to reach me is either through LinkedIn. There are no uh, I'm really thinking, I don't think there are any other Joe Astrakhan's in the world that I know of. Hmm. Um, so if you Google me, it's going to be pretty quick to find me and you can uh, reach out to the email address also that was on the uh, last slide that yeah, I uh, clicked to. And we'll be making, through you, the slides available to anybody who wanted to uh, have those slides. That's, that question came up a few times, so I appreciate that. So I'll... What I'll do is I'll attach, if you could send those to me, I'll attach those with the presentation that anyone that, that, uh, that asks, if that's okay, Joe. Yes, absolutely. All right, thank you. Andrew, final, and, final shot. Sure, uh, and like Joe, you know, I think we both have a passion for uh, the power that family business can have in this world uh, is moving beyond just financial performance to having a true commitment to values, a true commitment to people, a true commitment to communities um, that we, you know, we really believe that family businesses uh, have the power to change the world. And this is just one piece of, of that dynamic family business system that we hope will be helpful in uh, sustaining and building the success of your families moving forward. So um, our emails are up here. Uh, my website is just my name.com, andrewkite.com. Uh, you can reach out to me there or uh, look me up at Loyola as well. Excellent, Andrew. Give my dear friend Ann Smart a big hug, or at least a, a, a virtual hug since we can't do that, literally. We, we trust each other's quarantining abilities, so we will actually do a physical hug. There you go. Ann is one of uh, our, our colleagues at the center director level around the North America and one of the most stellar people I've ever met as well, as are you and, and Joe. So gentlemen, again, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, can't express our appreciation and gratitude to you enough. Lots of chats popping up with thank yous as well uh, to all of you who participated and joined us today. Again, we appreciate your time. This is uh, one in a series of workshops that we do for family business topics. We will be doing a uh, here in Southern California within the next 30 days uh, with Ali Taylor from Orange Kiwi consulting, our family business consultant here in Southern California, 
a deeper dive into this topic as well. And we can really work with you and your individual boards here in Southern California. And I encourage those of you from other parts of the country in North America to really lean on your center director as well. I know several of them are on here and they have not only a tremendous amount of knowledge themselves, but the bench strength to use the term Joe and Andrew that you talked about earlier is fantastic. Uh, I work with these people regularly and uh, the wisdom and the connections that they have is, is second to none. So thanks again, everyone. And uh, have a wonderful remainder of the day. Stay safe, stay healthy, uh, stay quarantined. If that's what you need to do, that's what my wife and I are doing right now. And um, we will uh, be back in touch with everyone. And again, if you want copies of this, reach out to your local center director and they will have it. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.